so today we have you know some some amazing news and i would like to welcome uh ray uh to uh to the show i'm not sure ray are you are you on ray good morning good morning hi ray hello great it's great to see you uh i know that your room is not a background <laughs> <laughs> no that's not a background nope <laughs> so so you're calling in from where i am calling in from just north of uh boston mass so uh it's morning but it's not morning here uh but a lot of um a lot of r d happens in this uh home office this kind of a part home office part um place where i keep my memorabilia old machines that i've worked on and stuff but it's great to be here it's um it's great to uh, celebrate this um, this kind of milestone for the SafeCast project and for all the volunteers who have put so much of themselves into it with um, uh, you know common goals of of helping people uh, through open data and citizen science. It's uh, tremendous, and thanks for inviting me. Yes, and and just very quickly for our audience, uh, Ray Ozzy is known for many things. Uh, I started my life as a young software engineer using Ray's products, uh, Lotus Notes, in the early 90s. And uh, uh, Ray has been a, you know, an amazing uh, software engineer and entrepreneur. But uh, later in, in your career, you were the chief software architect uh, under Bill Gates in Microsoft. Uh, I think you did something like building Azure and other things. So a lot of people are using that today. And but I know you. I met you personally, literally exactly ten years ago when we started Safecast. And you were, you're one of the, the the founding members and also the the brain trust of of of, of us all. And uh, and and so you you have been with us for for ten years. And maybe it's nice if you could share a little bit about you know why you got excited about being a part of the Safecast journey and 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 what that means to you. Absolutely. Um, I think if you try to place where you were at that time, I was um, I was probably in the Boston area uh, or flying somewhere uh, uh, near here. And uh, when the tsunami happened, when we started seeing the news flooded with the um, the uh, the awful news of what was what was transpiring. Um, and immediately, you know, my my mind. Uh, I think it's a, just a human thing to do. You you connect with people more if you have um, uh, you connect in your heart with people if you have met them or been there, traveling. And some of the um, uh, the best memories that my family and I have had uh, were in touring in Japan initially on business, but then for pleasure. Um, over the years, uh, the decades, I've uh, I grew to know um, many people, um, primarily in the Tokyo region. But um, uh, uh, immediately we thought, how are they doing? Are they safe? What what's you know what's happening? So I um, I pinged. I actually don't recall the exact. Um, order here, but uh, either I saw an email fly by or I pinged Joey Ito. And I said, what can we do? Uh, what are people doing? Um, you know, how, how can, my skill is in technology. How can, um, how can I help? Is there any way that I can help? And he, he said many of uh, his colleagues, friends, associates, particularly in tech, um, uh, had been talking about this. And uh, he, he actually sent me a a little draft of a, um, an action plan uh, of something called rdtn.org um, that uh, you know, people were theorizing maybe we could find some way to mold technology into a way to measure radiation. Um, at that time, it was fairly challenging um, uh, and uh, you folks should speak more author authoritatively about this, but um, my perception was that people on the ground really didn't understand whether they were safe or whether they weren't safe. Um, uh, there was no real data um, that was available to them. Um, uh, the government was under great stress. Um, they were not publishing data. 
Uh, the power company was under great stress. They were not publishing data. And we were trying to think, how can we, how can we potentially um, help? And so um, Joey uh, pulled together um, a set of people um, uh, with Sean and, and Peter as his uh, co-conspirators and um, you know, got a bunch of people together. And I'm, I'm not sure, what week was that, uh, uh, Peter? That was- I think it was uh, mid-April, about a month after the accident. Uh, we got together and you know, in that month, you know, a little bit storytelling, but you know, I, when, when the earthquake happened, I've been in Tokyo for the last 30 years and my family is actually from Ishinomaki, which was the worst hit city during the tsunami itself. And in the first two days, you now when I was talking to Joey about Geiger counters, I was actually really trying to figure out what happened to my whole family in law at that time. And, uh, and it took some, by the time we met, I had put together, and we can, you know, we can talk about it later, we put together my first little Geiger counter circuit and we were tinkering and trying to figure out things. But uh, by the time we were, we were figuring out what to do, and we literally didn't have the equipment to go out and do what we wanted to do. We had experimented with crowdsourcing. That didn't work because people didn't have the Gaga counters and all these things. We only had a few and then you came and uh, that was, I think, around April 15 or something or 16 when the new context conference was there. And you came up with the idea, why don't we put it on a car? And for people that don't know me, I have never driven a car in my whole life, so I wouldn't have thought about that. But, but you, you, you said, Peter, we have to put this on a car. And he said, yeah, that's great. You know, I'll figure it out, except I can't drive. So and then we found people to drive the car and everything. And we did, in one week later, we did build the, 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 the first big IG, so to speak. But today, I want to, uh, you know, we want to talk a little bit about some, some new things. And uh, for, for, for many uh, people that know SafeCost, they know, no, no, we started with measuring radiation and we're still very much doing that. And today we're measuring, uh, of course, in Fukushima again. But also a couple of years ago, and, and uh, we started to look at air quality. And uh, Sean uh, has been working on that together with me and a lot of volunteers. And, and you started to pick that up about two, three years ago uh, in terms of how can we bring that to the next level? And, uh, and maybe you want to, maybe uh, if you can describe a little bit what the journey is. And I have a box here, so the moment. Uh, one moment we're kind of at the right moment. I'll open it up and, and we'll reveal what's in this box. So, so over to you, uh, uh, Ray, what, what's up in this box? Sure. Well, let me give you a little bit of a tiny bit of history before that, because Sean yes. was really the one who was um, uh, leading in, in the realm of um, trying to figure out if we could apply some of the same uh, um, citizen science methodologies that we're using to air that we had been using in radiation, Sean um, uh, built and and had built a, the the very first version of um, of an air sensor, which I believe it was just called Safecast Air at the time. And yes, as Peter has there, that was the um, uh, the first version of of something that I had built. Not as elegant as what uh, what Sean would do, but this was a a fairly uh, a multifunction device: two radiation sensors, two different kinds of air sensors. Um, uh, solar panel. Um, uh, this was my first foray since the 70s uh, into back into um, hardware. Um, I've done mostly software in my, my life. It's a little bit like RD2, you know, <laughs> a bit Star Wars really feeling here. Yes. But we learned. It was in my, it was a tremendous learning experience because um, uh, trying to trying to cite the these boxes. Uh, were, you know, in a place where there was enough sun was was a challenge. Trying to backhaul the data um, from these devices um, back out to the uh, the internet was a challenge. The initial device was LoRa based. Uh, LoRa is a, a a low power wireless technology that dribbles um, data out. That was the first version, the SolarCast that we started experimenting in cellular. And so, to make a long story short. Um, uh, over time, as we did multiple generations of devices, um, I became committed to getting lots and lots of these things out there to make an impact. And so we wanted to solve the the sighting problem, the problem of getting some getting it out there uh, without drilling holes in the outside of your house, without trying to figure out how to run a power cord. Um, uh, easy backhauling of data um, by cell cellular and, and uh, wireless. And so, Peter, uh, uh, the grand opening. Um, I got a uh, box here, it just, it just arrived, uh, you know, it just literally arrived here in Tokyo. 
and you know opening up the box and in there we find some adhesives no we're going to talk about that in a moment i guess and uh, uh and here it is so the air note so ray what is the air note the air note is a very simple um air quality measurement device um it is hopefully the opposite of many of the uh surveillance-centric uh, IoT devices that you might have uh, experienced in the home. This thing does one thing and it does it very well, and that is to uh, measure outdoor air quality where you are. All you have to do is um, uh, conceptualize, do I have a reasonably sunny window that I can attach this to, a window that opens, or a place that I could stick it on on the outside? And uh, there are little- uh, you have it. Right here in Tokyo. Oh, yeah, you can see it. Yep. And it's light enough. It's designed in an enclosure that's that's intentionally very, very lightweight so that it it doesn't present, you know, a burden when it's hanging up there. And we use these uh, wonderful little things called command strips. They're Velcro strips, but they're ex extremely easy to remove. If you want to uh, put it somewhere else, you can just snap it off. Uh, so it's, it's good adhesive, but it's also easily removable. And the concept here is that all you have to do if you buy it, and it's, uh, it's very affordable, it's a $150 US um, uh, and no ongoing subscription, all you have to do is open it up, um, you know, put the Velcro strips on, find a window to put it on, uh, turn the power switch on, on the bottom, um, and uh, uh, put it outside and that's it. You don't have to go through a registration process. You don't have to connect it to your Wi-Fi. Um, it just works. And what happens is that um, on the inside, uh, what you might be able to see is um, it, it reports, uh, we have very clean air on the inside here. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> It reports the uh, um, the va a value that you select, but by default PM two point five, um, uh, and it it has little indications like, hey, I'm trying to get a GPS location, or hey, I'm I'm uh, you know using cellular, but that's it. So at a glance, yeah. you or your family can find out what the air quality is on the outside. Yeah, I was what just looking there? at the one we have here on the window, and and uh, the air, the the P is it yeah 17.5 17.5 yeah okay so so that is the air quality it is a particular matter for people that don't know that that's the amount of of small particles that that we have in you know in 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 the air so it's sitting here on the safe cause window outside this you may have noticed we are blessed with a highway next to our office that is zipping by uh, but it gives an indication of how what the air quality is uh, just to put things in perspective, you know, people always talk about, you know, the smog in China or whatever that would have an index of around eight, nine hundred or way up there. So uh, this is by all means not actually very, uh, very, uh, you know, bad on, on a larger scale. But the thing about is interesting about measuring air quality is, is that most people don't realize it changes dramatically throughout the day. It goes up and down quite a bit because human activity goes up, down a bit, quite up, up and down. And during the night, it goes down because we're not driving around and we're not doing as many things as we do during the time, daytime. So, so I have, I have the, the sensor here. And, and, and Ray, I just wanted to repeat, are you, are you meaning saying that this is $150 only? I mean, running $150 on, on, one time. And that's one that's time, right? Thing. And right, so because because you know, I might when we started a couple of years ago, you know, we had to buy SIM cards, and it was just like fifty dollars a month to run it, and you know, it was very hard to get IoT going. But you know, this is all included, no no subscriptions, no need to do anything, and this works in in how many countries? One hundred and thirty seven. So you have you have, you just take it out of the box, stick it on the window, and and you're you're good to go. And that's it. And that's it. And the, the other kind of interesting thing um, was that it was our goal that at a glance, you could get a sense, you could get immediate feedback on what it's like outside. If you're wondering, should, should my, you know, if it's a particularly bad time, there are fires in the area, should I let my children out, uh, you know, to play today, you know, or should, should we keep them inside? You get Im that immediate feedback. But also, this thing has cellular in it, and it's transmitting those readings 
up and, and those, those readings are becoming part of the SafeCast open data set. Essentially by agreeing to use this, you are agreeing to allow that data to be um, licensed Creative Commons Zero like the entire uh, SafeCast data set. Um, and so if you happen to have a cell phone um, and uh, you look at the, um, uh, the device, it recognizes the, the QR code and uh, brings you to, um, uh, oops, there it is, uh, brings yeah, so, you to the historical data. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, yes, yeah, so we're trying to also take it, yeah. I, I have a I have a on Zoom here in the studio here in at our office. Yeah, perfect. Yes. So this is your uh, this is your yours at in, in Boston. This is this is what it is uh, here on the window right now. And so you can see that it's pretty, it's kind of came down, but but last two days the air was uh, was a bit worse actually than it is right now. And um, it's kind of raining right now in Tokyo, so that may have something to do with it as well. You can then you know. I'm, I'm, you can see the location. Now I'm doing something that doesn't really work well in reverse, but uh, so so you can you can see this and you can see what the location is where the safe cost office is, and and the data that is coming off these sensors array. This this is going to our servers in safe cost where we disseminate the data as open data, public data for anybody and everybody to use. And I think as there's going to be way more sensors out there, we finally will have a very large data set to work on. Um, for radiation, we built it over the last 10 years. We have over 160 million measurements we have done with all volunteers worldwide. Largest data set in existence, largest open data set. A lot of researchers, and tonight, you know, or later in the, you know, later in the show, because tonight it depends where you are, uh, with our, with our, uh, with the roundtable program, we're going to talk a lot about how researchers have, have found SafeCast to be a source of, uh, of, of, of doing more research simply because that data is not available. And I think for air quality data, interestingly enough. There is a lot of data out there, but there's not a lot that is being measured globally in a consistent way like we did for radiation. And, and also make it very affordable. This equipment used to be very, very expensive. Actually, 10 years ago when Safegas started, these sensors didn't even exist, right? And a lot of the technology in this box didn't even exist two, three years ago. Um, I'm, you know, uh, for, from a, uh, so Ray, from where we saw, you know, we went from, from this solar panel, what is it, three years ago? That's right, that's right. To this solar panel, and for people that are in the know, it is not uh, trivial to run a device it's with such a small solar panel that has to use, uh, you know, wireless communications and run a, a sensor and everything. So I think that's where 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 the where all the the effort went, and also we learned a lot from our deployments over the years of sensors that there is many things that can go wrong, and the simpler the better, uh, but making it simple is is the hardest piece. So I think we've reached a major breakthrough. And I just want to kind of uh, uh, check with Sean, you know, uh, who's who's uh, on the line, and and you know, you uh, Sean, you you got your air note. Uh, my air note is stuck to a window about four blocks away from here because uh, I don't have a window at my house where I can use it. <laughs> you need a sunny window. This is the only thing you need, and we know that not yeah. everybody has a sunny window, so but. Well, I'm in Vancouver where it's overcast and rainy most of the time anyway, and my house faces north. North. So uh, there's only a couple windows that get more than a few minutes of direct sun a day. And uh, we tried, but that was not enough to keep it keep it going. <laughs> it's true, but the trick is, is you get the sensor and then you just give it to a good neighbor or friend yep. to put exactly. it on a window. And that's all around. You just share it. And, and the whole point is, is we want to share the data. And uh, and then you you can see from your mobile phone or whatever what's what's up in the neighborhood anyway. So you, it's it's the block away or uh, as as well, but, right? That's awesome. But I would like to. I just want to take this time for one minute though to um, to say how much admiration I have for the Safecast project and for the 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 uh, experimentation spirit of the of the volunteers over the course of these years. I have learned an immense amount um, on this journey. As you know, as as Peter said, you know, we the we started with um, you know a, a Geiger counter, and it was it would it was much lar larger than this. I don't know if you have one within reach, Peter, but you know this is the workhorse of of the Safecast project measuring uh, radiation. Um, you know the 
uh, you know, then we went to the, you know, the large size one. Then we uh, began to shrink it. And this was, the, this was a smaller solar panel version, you know, on the way um, to, uh, to where, we, where we got. And we're always experimenting. Um, so, for example, uh, yeah, as, as you can see there. And, and you, can, you can open it. And, I, and Ray, I know you, you've been an avid collector of all our, of all our uh, intermediate prototypes. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. And there are some that, that have never made it into broad production. For example, this is a device that yes. um, my, my, <laughs> my patient wife had it on her car for almost a year. And what this does is um, it's, it's got a, a, a radiation sensor and, and you know, power supply and a cellular modem, um, and it runs on AAA batteries, and you just have to replace them twice a year. Um, and it, and it, it, so, it, Ray, we, we don't have that one in our collection here yet, but uh, we do want we to keep that. things we up to date. <laughs> that's, all, and, that's, that's fantastic. And as Peter was, as as you may be able to see on Peter's table, we've taken, we've also taken the the air note as it is right now, and we're trying to say how can we increase the ubiquity of radiation measurement by turning uh, the air note into a radiation device by just simply replacing, you know, the um, uh, the air sensor with a Geiger tube um, inside yes. and, yes. and power. So yeah, so so the, so it's a little bit hard to see, but but we have two we have two versions here. This is the air quality which is currently available, and this is the uh, the, the prototype version that we're still kind of finalizing and tuning and, and currently calibrating. But this is the air quality. You know, the both are the same, so you could have two on your window doing different measurements next to each other, right? And you know maybe over over the years there could be a small collection, and you can pick and choose what you would <laughs> like to measure. Uh, and I think maybe the radiation. Them, maybe we can uh, make them in different flavors. Exactly, and 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 uh, I, I think also so Ray. I think on the radiation one, I'm I'm very sure a lot of people are also interested in in having the radiation version, and we'll you know hopefully not into the distant future we will talk about that again uh, yep. as to how that uh, is going to evolve and, and how people can get that one as well. Uh, but for now, what is available and people can start pre-ordering is the Aeronote uh, yep. for ridiculous, you know, knowing what the costs were of the previous generations, etc. And the ability of this to run outside, because I, I meet a lot of people and say, yeah, I can make this thing and it works inside. And, I, and, and it's also important to measure air quality inside your house because you breathe the air inside and outside. But for us, for safe cars, it's always been so important to be able to measure outside because that is the common space that we share and share that information, right? So, and making things work outside, just even if it's on the window outside, makes things incre incrementally hard because of powering things, making it weatherproof, uh, making it last a whole lot more, you know, it's, it's raining right now and you, we can see the water dripping off the, of the thing, but all of that needs to be brought into, into space. And if you wire it up through the house, it becomes very hard to, for most people to install. So, so that is the huge difference in my mind between some of the things that you can buy for your home, which is important, but this is really allows us as citizen science, as people together to start measuring our environment uh, rapidly. And today we'll talk about the air node uh, as, as to what it, you know, how it impacts other things in, 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 uh, in, in many ways uh, as we go. If I, if I could right. just add one more thing and then, I, then I'll stop. I want to make sure that, um, that viewers understand that this was, this has been, an, uh, the, all of these devices, but also the AirNode have been a collaboration between volunteers at SafeCast who are just passionate about what they do and wanting to make a difference. And um, uh, people who work for a commercial entity, a company of mine uh, called Blues Wireless. Um, I'm bringing that up because if you'd like to get an air note, um, you just go to blues.io, go into the store, and it's right there. Um, we're, we'll be shipping it in a couple weeks. Uh, there's some final fine tuning of the enclosure that's happening. Um, uh, but we're super excited about it. Just go there and uh, order one, and it'll be uh, drop shipped uh, as soon as we can. Okay, so so I just wanted to see. I know there's a lot of people online. I just wanted to make a big shout out to to some of our our, our special guests that have uh, already logged in. We're going to feature them later. But I can see Miles O'Brien. I can see Mark Davidson. 
I saw uh, Watanabe Norio, uh, Konnichiwa, ohayou gozaimasu. I'm seeing Junya Madeira, who is in the Safecast follow car, is following our car. Uh, and, uh, and we're all going to connect later in the day.